story, the actual story of what occurred um, with the story of the 1895 Butte explosion, because some of you may not be aware of what occurred that night. And as Kim mentioned, we are going to memorialize the 125th anniversary next week, so we're also going to invite you to come to that. We would love that. Um, but I just want to do a brief introduction. My name is Lindsay Mulcahy, and I'm the vice chairman um, of this board here. We're a nonprofit, 501c3. And I'm going to tell you more about that in a little bit. Um, but we wanted to start off with a story to give you a little background as to why our group is formed and what our mission is. Um, so in order to do that, we decided Judy Chadwick and Karen Henningsen would be the best to do this because they were the ones that were here every Monday, along with um, a couple of our other board members. Um, but they were the ones that wrote a good portion of our book that we have for sale. So they've done a lot of research, and Judy gets emotional <laughs> very easily about it. Sorry, that wasn't a great way to <laughs> throw you under the bus there. Um, but uh, they uh, are both great people with big hearts, and they're going to tell our story today. So uh, if you guys would like to stand real quick. Um, they're going to be sharing the microphone. We only have the one, so they're going to share it back and forth. Uh, but we have Judy Chadwick on your right, and Karen Henningsen on your left there. All right, so stand on the stool. <laughs> <laughs> you can come around this way. Hi, as she said, my name is Karen Henningsen, and I'm one of the co-secretaries for the board, and this is my partner in crime. <laughs> Today we're here to talk about a tragic event known as the Great Explosion of 1895. 125 years ago, 15 firemen answered the call of duty, and only two of them returned. They were scarred forever by the memory of their fallen brothers. 125 years ago, one policeman answered the call of duty and never returned to patrol the streets of Butte. 125 years ago, 44 civilians rushed to a disaster to save their city and their fellow citizens, but never returned to their families who were scarred forever by their loss. 125 years ago, four magnificent fire horses answered the call of duty. Only one of them would return to the empty station, scarred forever by his injuries and the loss of his companions and the men who cared for him. 125 years ago, a faithful dog waited obediently for the master who would never return, leaving his post to find his master, staying with his body throughout the night and the weeks ahead until he finally joined his friend in death. 125 years ago, Butte was changed forever, and no one would believe that this such a horrific night could be forgotten, but it was. 125 years later, we are here to resurrect the memories of the 13 firemen, one fire, a police officer, 44 civilians, three magnificent horses, and a faithful friend. From no memory to many memories, we did not forget. Okay, so this on the left here is the fire station that the 13 firemen left from. Actually, it was 15 firemen that left, excuse me. That's the, where they left the night of January 15, 1895. The next picture over is what this facility looked like before it was converted to the archives, and that was called the Court Street Station. And down below here is fire station number one, where we are very blessed to be able to put our memorial statue. Right now we have the call box and the pole, called fateful call box 72 and the pole are inside the fire station lobby if people wish to see it. And our horse Jim is waiting for some more members of his evening to arrive. Um, stop and see him. I stop and give him a kiss frequently. He doesn't do any though. <laughs> These are pictures of um, Fire Chief Cameron and Assistant John Sloan. Um, Fire Chief Cameron um, has a really tragic story to start with. Um, the, he was killed on Tuesday the 15th. His 10-month-old uh, um, twin son died on January 13th. He was at the fire station with his um, Fire, you know, the other firemen that night instead of being at home with his family. So he was killed on Tuesday. Then the really ironic story is his wife also passed away a month later 
We don't know what happened to the other five kids. We do know that she was buried in um, Nova Scotia. Assistant Fire Chief Sloan, Mrs. Sloan and Jack's wife um, were left with no family because Fire Chief Jack Sloan, this is uh, John Sloan Jr., was the Assistant Fire Chief. His son, uh, brother Ed was um, a fireman and their dad, Jack Sloan Sr. went running down to the explosion to find his boys and he was also killed. So that night, that family lost three family members and his wife was very ill and uh, his mother was just beside herself. She didn't know. Her whole family was gone in one, you know, one explosion. Sam Ash, Dave Mose, Ed Sloan, I guess there's five firemen, excuse me, PJ Norley, and George Piper. They are all buried in one casket at Mount Moriah with Chief Cameron. Actually, it's Ash, yeah. Moses, yes. Sloan, um, Norley, yeah. and Cameron. There was not enough left to um, facilitate separate burials for those first firemen. So their graves are marked by, by um, brothers in life, brothers in death. And they're all buried at Mount Moriah in one cemetery. And these are the paid firemen. Angus Cameron, all that they found to identify him by was his belt buckle. Mm -hmm. If not for that, nobody would have known for sure, sorry, who was who. The, there it was a report in the papers that a lady saw four bodies fly into the air at the first explosion. So we can't begin to comprehend what this was like. This is something none of us, pray God, will ever see. Um, go ahead, Karen. Where the? Oh. Okay. These are, um, these are what they used to call the Minutemen. And basically, they're the same as our volunteer fire department. These men were also included in the death of what we call the 13 firemen. Um, the situation that they had back then was um, a little bit different than we have now. They, they all came out of the fire, same fire station and everything. So we had William Brokaw, William Copeland, Nolan, W.H. Nolan, John Bowman, um, Thomas Burns and Stephen DeLowry. These new stones that you see here were um, put up with sorry, um, by the State Firemen's Association a few years ago because so many of the stones, as you can see, they're starting to deteriorate. So they went through and on a lot of the firemen that they couldn't read their, their stones, they did put up new, new stones for them. And in some cases, the stones were done by the family. So, what we have here is the hook and ladder truck after the explosion, and you can see it looks a little tough. On the other side, we this is a later picture on the other side, but it gives you a, a better idea of what the hook and ladder truck looked like. And Jim, the wonderful horse that I can't talk enough about, he originally was on the hook and ladder truck that night. In, in later years, when he was helping at the fire department, when he went by the hook and ladder truck, he kicked at it. He remembered. Okay, this, this represents the um, call, fateful call box 72. This is where um, Officer Seinborn put in the call for the explosion that was happening, that the fire that was happening. At that point, they didn't realize that it was going to turn into the explosions that it did. This is actually the fire uh, box that is constructed and inside the lobby of the fire station right now. It's going to be a permanent part of our statue. This map represents um, the area. The Butte hardware is in the yellow, the hardware store. Kenyon Connell. Um, warehouse 
and the Montana Central Rail Station. And these, it kind of gives you an idea of the um, size of the, the um, event field. Fire started. Those two warehouses had illegal amounts of dynamite stored in them, and we'll show you a map more about where the, um, what we call the missiles of death came from. Centra, Montana Central Fire Station was just decimated. Mm -hmm. There was nothing left to it. Um, and rail cars and everything, we have pictures of those later on. But um, that whole area was impacted, as well as the whole city of Butte and further. So this, on your right, is the type of a stove that started the fire in the Kenyon Connell building. You can see the corner there, it was in that office. And if you look to your left, you'll see in the upper corner where it's lined in blue, and that's where the dynamite was. And of course, it was surrounded by rabble heads, which in this day we would call shrapnel. Okay, this is some of the shrapnel that um, actually caused the most damage to humans and to the buildings. Um, these are the rabble heads that we talk about. They're approximately the size of a brick. They, are, they were lined around the dynamite so that if a stray bullet came through the building, it wouldn't explode, or uh, you know, explode the dynamite. They did not take into account that a fire may set the dynamite off. So all of those that you saw in the blue around that corner all became what I call flying missiles of death, as well as railroad ties. These are, are the railroad ties are up there, and these are fish plates, which is another um, railroad device. All of this stuff started flying through the air with the first explosion, and of course there were two other major explosions after that. And this is what killed a lot of the people. Were, were like I said, the missiles of death. These are the types of powder boxes that were used. Um, Judson Hardware is in the upper left-hand corner here, and Hercules is what was at the Kenyon Connell. We found two types of pictures to kind of give you a clue of what they would have looked like, and we hope down the road to possibly be able to make a connection with the people that did this type of dynamite. Okay, now we're going to start into the um, <laughs> debris. Picture on uh, right here is of the two horses that were connected to the hose cart, uh, Nick and Prince. If you look really close at them, you can see the devastation to them. But thankfully, these two horses actually saved one of the two surviving firemen. Dave McGee was between these two horses blanketing them because it was extremely cold that night. And when the first blast hit, one of the horses, of course, was killed instantly, fell over, knocked him down, killed the second horse. Well, then when the second explosion happened, he was pinned between the horses. And they took the brunt of the explosion. And that was if the hose cart was up in the far corner. Faithful triangle, there was a, some pieces of metal that just fell, and they fell exactly like that. And in between those pieces of metal were eight bodies. And you can see the size of some of the stuff that was flying through the air. I mean, look at the pipes and stuff back there. There'll be other pictures um, showing, you know, a, a bigger. Um, picture of the size of the debris that was blown around that night. I mean, it's when we, if I take a step back to the dynamite, they, it was said that had this explosion happened in the summer, that way more people would have died, way more destruction to do because the dynamite was actually frozen in a lot of, and it kept a lot of it from going off. And you can just tell by this debris field how terrible it was. Um, just mass destruction, again, that's unbelievable. What you see on the right that looks like um, maybe the side of a building is actually railroad cars. Um, we found an interesting little tidbit of information, which was in the warehouse, there were 
many, many candles stored, and that's because the miners used the candles in the mine. And so when the explosion happened, there were hundreds of candles everywhere. And we think that's pretty significant because we're going to do a candlelight ceremony next Wednesday for the 125th anniversary of this event. And, and what's really cool is we had decided to do that before this little obscure newspaper article showed up telling us about the candles. So it was, it was divine intervention for us. We have a lot of that. Okay, this is just some more uh, pictures of the debris. You can see what's left of the buildings up there. And, I mean, you look at it, we, it's been described that the first um, explosion went into the air, the second one fanned out across the ground. And if you look really closely, and these pictures are all in our books, yeah, there's some boys and a dog standing up there. You know, were they looking for lost relatives? Was the dog looking for his master? Um, we don't know. But uh, the size of the boys and the size of the disaster is just um, unbelievable. I can't imagine. So the, the snow, as you can see, made it very difficult to do recovery. It maybe helped a slight bit with the fires but it really made it difficult for people, volunteers, who have come in to help find bodies and, and help people know if their family members were okay or not. It was not nice in, on January 15, 1895. It was a very cold night, and the next day, the whole city was utterly overwrought with the situation. But the citizens of Butte were fabulous, and they came out to try to help find bodies and take care of things. As you can, as you can see, the I mean, the devastation to the brick and mortar buildings. Um, there was no way that the human body had a chance. Basically, there were so many body parts that they were picked up, put in baskets, taken to the mortuaries, and probably disposed of. You know, because there was no way, there was no DNA back then. There was no way to identify which arm belonged to which person. So, um, but you can see from the devastation why so many people were killed because the people just didn't have a chance with all the explosions. And I lost my spot. You got to go to the next one, Lindsay. I think. Oh, we didn't see this one yet. Oh. This is just more of the debris field and um, the amount of snow and stuff that really complicated matters um, for cleaning up. These were some of the volunteers that came in, and when I first saw this picture, the first thing I thought of was I remember seeing a picture of the people at 9-11 standing there looking at that debris field and thinking, where are we going to start? And to me, that's what these guys look like. It's like, where do we start even cleaning this up, trying to identify who was killed, you know, everything. I mean, it was just a, it looked like a sense of bewilderment to me. And again, there's a close-up of uh, one of the rail cars. The problem with the rail, it being so close to the rail station, we will never know if 58 is actually our number because it was a transit town and people were getting on and off the trains at that time, and when that explosion happened, was there people that we didn't even know were here yet? Wow. So, you know, a 58 is an educated guess. And if you look at the, sorry. go back for one sec, Liz, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. If you look at the size of, of the volunteers that are there in comparison to the pieces of wood and pipe and everything, it makes them extremely insignificant. Hey, Karen, how, how much uh, illegally stored dynamite was there, and, and what was uh, what were you supposed to have? They were only supposed to, I don't know the exact numbers, but they were only supposed to have a limited amount, and they figured that they had well over three rail cars in each building. And the problem was they did, it was supposed to be stored out of town, and they did not want to keep running it back and forth, so they thought, hmm, we'll just put some rabbit heads around it, and we'll be fine. And as it turned out, it wasn't fine. And we kind of understand to a degree why they did part of that. 
the dynamite was stored to the west of town, kind of in the area of Ramsey. And in the wintertime, that would have been the pits to load that stuff on a horse-drawn wagon and take it to town. So we understand why they did it, but they never dreamt of the repercussions that would happen. St. James this is a um, this is a picture of the St. James Hotel. It was on the corner of Utah and Arizona, and the the owner Henry Jefferson found a five gallon metal bucket embedded in the roof of the hotel. This is a picture of Sherman's mortuary room with some of the bodies. I'm guessing the ones that are under the sheets are still waiting to be identified. Which out of the 58 victims, there were eight that were never identified or claimed by a family member. So you can only imagine, I mean, the, even the number um, of victims spread out between the different mortuaries that there were, I mean, it was still a huge, um, you know, event for everybody. It impacted a lot of people. You guys want to talk about the windows real quick? Oh, yeah. The force of the explosion was so um, intense, and there was three major explosions, that it blew out every window in the city of Butte. They did not have enough glass in the state of Montana to replace the windows. Um, some people have probably heard the story that there was a saw blade that found as far as Rocker. They felt the, and saw the explosion in Belgrade. Um, it, I mean, it was just massive, and it's just so hard for us as a group to believe that something this massive happened in Duke's history, and it's been lost for 125 years. This is the funeral cortege, the, the wagons with the bodies left from the central fire station, which currently is Dr. Robeson's office. They went over to Montana Street and down. First cemetery they stopped at was Mount Moriah. Our numbers say there were over 3,000 people, but the funeral cortege was so long that when the first wagons got to Mount Moriah, there were still people on Broadway Street that had not made it to Montana Street. These are some more pictures from the funeral cortege. This is Governor Rickards and his staff leading the way. They had the, um, the military um, honor guard and stuff come into town. That picture is a picture of the way, uh, flatbed wagon that they used. There were actually nine coffins on that wagon. Eight of them were the eight unidentified um, victims that were going to be buried by the city. One casket was the casket with Chief Cameron. P.J. Norling, Sam Ash, and Dave Moses. And um, those are all buried in Mount Moriah. And just a little side remark on that. Many cities in Montana understood that Butte had gone through hell on earth. And they sent many, many flowers. And they said the scent of the flowers was very, very evident, even on this cold, cold day in January. Notes here. The picture on the left is Jim, and he is with Fire Chief Peter Sanger. Um, this is also Jim on the right, and Jim was lent to the fire department in Anaconda to help them train some horses. <coughs> they were so impressed with him that the Anaconda Fire Chief had this picture taken. On the back of the wall is the 13 firemen who died. A copy of this picture was at the Anaconda Fire Station, but they also sent it to Fire Chief Peter Sanger. And I just have a little bit of more information about Jim. So he was an extraordinary fire horse, selected 
1892 at seven years of age. He died in 1916 at 31 years of age. He gave Butte 24 years of his life. On the fateful night, he left the fire station pulling the hook and ladder wagon with his friend, Baldy. After the explosion, people realized that Baldy was dead, but that Jim was still alive. So they cut him out of his harness. Jim had such a magnificent heart. He walked back to the fire station he left from all by himself and there was nobody there to greet him. He was horribly hurt, bore those scars all his life. It was thought that Jim would never work again, but he did on and off until 1906 at 21 years of age. And even then, he helped by pulling a wagon load of flowers on what they called Decoration Day. He was 24 at the last time that he did that. It, this picture here that you see on the right, that was from 1900. <laughs> chief Sanger at, was the fire chief when Jim was in that picture. But we have a couple of funny little notes on Jim. Um, fire Chief Flannery, who was before Chief Sanger um, had Jim as his light buggy horse. And the fire chief at that point in time, the alarm would go off and they would take a buggy up to the fire chief's house and pick him up. Well, one night when Jim was working, the fire alarm went off and they put Jim to his harness, to the buggy, and then the, the fireman went to get something. Well, Jim said, hey, I'm not waiting for you. He took off, he went, Chief Flannery's house all by his lonesome. <laughs> and Chief Flannery was one of the two survivors yes. that night. Wow. And one other little tidbit on Jim is the firemen really loved him. He he was a miracle animal to them. And they taught him how to chew tobacco. <laughs> and apparently he really liked it. <laughs> Okay, this is where the story of uh, the dog comes in that's in our statue. We've run across what we think is the only picture of the dog digging through the rubble. This dog belonged to Fireman Copeland. He was trained to stay at the um, Central Fire Station when the fire bells rang. Well, that night after he heard the explosion, he knew something was terribly wrong. So when the Port Street Station, which was from here, went by, he went after them, and he darted away from the firemen, went to the debris field, found William Copeland's body, and when the other rescuers got to Copeland, the dog was laying there licking Copeland's face and wounds. He, wouldn't, he really didn't want the, firemen, or the rescuers to touch his master. Well, they finally did, and they loaded him in a wagon, and they were taken him to the mortuary, and the dog followed Copeland's body to the mortuary that night. He sat outside, he cried all night, they tried to run him off, he wouldn't leave. He sat there the entire time the body was at the mortuary. When they had the, the funeral for Copeland, he followed the, or the funeral procession down Montana Street to Mount Moriah Cemetery. That night the caretaker went out and this dog was laying on Copeland's grave. So he tried to coax him away and the dog would come away to get some food and water, but would scratch at the door to get back out and he'd go back and lay on the grave. Didn't matter if it was cold, hot, rainy, snowy, whatever. Approximately five weeks later, the caretaker found him dead on Copeland's grave. So he's actually one of the saddest victims in this story because he basically died of a broken heart. Um, the sad thing is, as much research as we've done on this whole project, we have never been able to come up with a name for the dog. And one of our plans in the future, when we're getting ready to put that part of the statue up, is possibly having a name the dog contest with the school kids to get a name for him. But, uh, you know, he was probably 
They say man's best friend, and he was definitely Copeland's because he could not wait to join Copeland again. So. Were they buried together? Unfortunately, humans and pets at that time could not be born, uh, buried. But the caretaker did say in the newspaper article that he was given a kindly funeral, so I think he was probably taken care of better than most animals at that point in time because everybody felt sorry for him. But it's just amazing that all the newspaper articles that talk about this dog, there's not a name out there. And so Father Beretta did a, a wonderful story on this dog. Um, if I remember correctly, it was the big black dog who died of a broken heart. And he gave him the name of Jack because he had to have a name. You're telling a story, you have to have a name. Um, but we are, like Karen said, going to do something with the school kids and have a name the dog contest. But Father Beretta put that story out there for the whole world to see and we thank you for that. Now, I selected Jack because Jack was the most popular name for large dogs in 19th century America. So it was a small probability that I would be right, but it was just a pure guess. Yeah. It was a good guess. And we do know that it was a big black Newfoundland. We do know that. So on your left here, we have the family of Two Bear Robins. Two Bear was the oldest person to die in the explosion. Um, he was 52 years old, and he was just somebody who rushed in to help. Um, the next picture is of Joan Robbins, and that um, headstone is a GAR headstone for the Great American Republic, so he fought in that, that war. And the following headstone is for um, E.G. E. Get Fraser, who was the youngest known person killed in the accident. How old and was he? He was 12. Yeah, he was just 12. He, uh, his family was the first family. Uh, let me start over. He, they were the first white family in the Big Hole Valley before they moved to Butte. He was the first white child born in the Big Hole Valley, and his father built a school in the Big Hole Valley. But after his father passed away, his mom moved back to Butte with all of her children. So um, at Mount Moriah, 36 people were supposed to be buried there. We found only markers for 19. So we're missing 17 markers at Mount Moriah. At St. Patrick's, 10 people were supposed to be interred. We only found four markers. We're missing six. 12 people were shipped to family. So we have 23 people without a marker. Thank you, Karen. Um, we need markers for those 23 people. The next project, after the memorial statue is completed, will be starting to raise money to have markers, because everybody should have a marker at a cemetery. Everybody deserves to be honored. And I found this quote that really made what we're trying to do at the cemetery important to me. It says, there are three deaths. When the body ceases to function, when the body is consigned to the grave, and when sometime in the future, your name is spoken for the last time. And that's not going to happen to these people. We are going to have headstones, and we'll have their names at our memorial site. And when people read signs, they read them usually out loud, their names will be spoken. They are not gone to eternity. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. A little bit more on the youngest victim. Um, he actually lived two weeks after the explosion. We think he was hit in the head with a rabble head because he never regained consciousness. He had a broken arm, a broken leg, and um, his family sat by his side the whole time knowing that the outcome probably was not going to be good. And uh, so he is designated as our youngest victim, like you said, he was 10, or 12. Um, we actually had 13 
children under the age of 18 that were killed that night. And you can see them on our paper dolls out in a lobby or in our book. You can read their stories about their families, where they're buried, um, different facts about them. But this didn't just impact the firemen and adults. This impacted everybody. And you can see uh, up there how time has been really evil to these headstones. Um, like the Gibbon Fraser headstone, we tried all kinds of things. It was very difficult. We finally came up with what we think is right. The Sloan family in the middle on the top, um, their stuff is still readable. They have a beautiful grave site. The next picture on the top right, that piece of headstone that you can see the hands on had fallen into the grass. And so Jim McCarthy picked it up and put it on there so we could have a picture of the whole headstone. Those types of things will be taken care of also. In the case that there is a family that we can talk to, of course, we would have to do that first. But for people that there's nobody to speak for them, we will take care of them. Um, it was a wonderful, sentimental journey trying to find the graves. We really enjoyed it. Karen's term for it is um, cemetery creeping, but it was, it was, it was really a very, wonderful experience and just you were just immersed in the horror of everything and, that, and up until that point we did not realize that so many graves because they were probably just given a cheap wooden marker or something like that that so many of these victims you go there and there's a patch of grass and you know they're there because we have the maps but there's nothing to designate that they're there wow. so but the city did, like Karen said, they put up a marker of some type at first. It's just that the winters and summers in Butte are tough. For a long time, um, they said this is how the old timers in Butte um, remember or figured time um, is, you know, how, how long since the great explosion. They probably never ever imagined that. 125 years later, we would be here trying to retell the story and make people aware. I mean, this was a huge <coughs> tragedy prior to the Granite Mountain speculator, and it should have never been forgotten. And so the board, that's our project, is to get the story out there and to have a memorial to recognize all of these people. And then, of course, now we've taken on a second project of fixing the tombstones. <laughs> so. I think there's one more with the board. Oh, no. Kids. Okay. So now we're going to turn it over to Lindsay. Um, like she said, she's our vice chairman. And she's going to tell you more about how our group came into being. Judy and I are more into the history part of it. And Lindsay <coughs> can help us with the formation. Can we just a second? Yeah. Okay. So the book that we are, are talking about um, and selling I, I just need to share a little bit with you. We had several board members that helped us do research. Lindy t Lindsay took all of that research and combined it together factually. Um, Karen and I wrote the, the book. I gave her little bits and pieces and she magically wove them into the story. So if you buy the book, this lady did 85% of it, and she did a fabulous, fabulous job. Thank you, Karen. That's the truth. All right. <laughs> Great job. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about our group and how we came to be and what our mission is today, um, which you guys probably have a rough idea of anyway at this point. Um, so how we came to be was actually started with the Montana History Club. Let me see. Hold on one second. Just, just clip that on. There you go. Let's see. How's that? Can you hear me? Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we came to be <laughs> with the Montana History Club, which is headed by uh, Chris Fisk of Butte High School um, and his multiple advisors, of which some of our uh, board is part of. But every year we do something called the Cabbage Patch Experience and we usually walk the kids down to what we call ground zero of where this explosion occurred, which is now near where the depot bar is. Um, and one year, one of our students, uh, he has since graduated, um, 
quite a few years ago now, but he decided, you know, this was something that was worth remembering, and there was no memory of it. So he uh, identified as close to possible as to where this site originally was, the Canyon Connell Warehouse, and he wrote, no memory in spray paint. Um, so that was kind of the catalyst for this. This photo was taken about three years ago. He graduated way before that. <laughs> 10 years ago? I don't know for sure. Probably somewhere around there. Huh? It's only been about five, hasn't it? Since Robert graduated? Since the kid that did this? Oh, it's, no, it's, it's been far longer than that. Yeah, I would say probably between 8 and 10. Um, but that was kind of the catalyst for us. Um, a lot of our board members are also in the adult education view history class. And uh, then we started to join together. Here's another close up of it. Is this the. Yeah. So, um, so this was originally the students just wanted something like this. They were kind of our, our inspiration for getting this going. If the kids are upset about it, then maybe we should be too. So they wanted just a small marker in this area to remember this uh, great disaster by. Um, then a girl named Tori Turner, uh, right here, she did um, a class project for her Butte History class called Footsteps Through History, and they make a little video, and you know it's very tech savvy because that's what they're all into, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and she made a video about this, and that was the next catalyst. And Chris Fisk um, came together and he asked um, people he thought would be concerned about this, people that he thought would be active in making um, an actual memorial occur. And this occurred in 2015? We started in 2015. Okay, yeah, years are flying by. <laughs> um, so anyway, he asked a few people from our adult ed class along with a few other community members. Um, one example is uh, now Judge Whalen. Uh, Bob Whalen, he was part of our group and he still is um, part of our group. Uh, but we started to get going, and we decided we would be official about it, <laughs> and we started a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So if you guys do decide to make a donation to us, it is, uh, you know, tax write-off, so that's always a bonus. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we've had, for the main part, the same people been involved for the last five years. Um, we've had a couple people, uh, one doesn't live here majority of the year anymore, she became one of those snowbirds, so she stepped down. Um, we had a couple other people, they just didn't have enough time because of their uh, young families, so they stepped down as well. But that's alright because we've gained new members and that's always great too. So here's a few of our board members um, pictured at different events that we've had. Um, so one of the things we had to come, we had to do, is I, I want to mention this really quick. We chose our name, Butte Historical Memorials. Uh, we were going to do something centered around the Kenyon Connell warehouse disaster, the Great Explosion, something like that. We decided, no, what if we get going on this and we're able to do more for more disasters that occurred here in Butte? You know, there were many mine disasters, other things like that. So that's why we chose our name, Butte Historical Memorials. And as these two already mentioned, after our statue is done for this, we would like to keep going and mark those graves. Um, so that's just one example right there where we'd like to keep going already. But so that's how we came up with our name. And then we had to uh, we had to convince an artist to help us with our vision. <laughs> we wanted something concrete that we could show people um, that would convey what we were going for. So um, Martha Cooney Simonich decided she would help us out, and she was touched by this story, and she came up with this image, which you've probably seen before. Um, but this is kind of what we're going for with our memorial here. And then we had to come up with a sculptor, of course, so that was another grand discussion that we had. And we contacted um, Jim Dolan. He lives in Belgrade, and he's already completed two. He's working on a third piece, and he, uh, he has work around the world. One of his biggest sculptures is in Japan. Um, he also has sculptures in Bozeman and Ennis, so you may have been familiar with some of his work. Yes, just the Blue Horses. Oh, the Blue Horses, that was just on TV, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I saw Yeah, yeah, so you're probably familiar with his work, whether you know it or not. So, um, we kind of, this is what we call the dream, and we broke it down into different uh, categories here. We have raised enough money that Jim the Horse has completed, um, 
call lock 72 and Fire Chief Angus Cameron is started and is slated for completion quite soon. Um, so we are still raising money for the rest of these figures here. And we've raised money through many different venues. Um, we've had, we've shown uh, Gus Chambers, The Hidden Fire, you may have seen this on PBS. Some of you may have come and watched it with us this evening. Um, we've had, uh, last year we had a highly successful Meterville style spaghetti dinner. Did anybody go to that? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, so just things like that, as well, we always have buckets out for donation. We have applied for grants. Um, we've received, you know, every, every donation counts from $1 to Town Pump graciously donated uh, $40,000 to us. So little by little, we're, grab we're, you know, going to get this done here. So here's what's been accomplished. We have this chosen site. Uh, we chose this site at fire station number one. We talked about trying to do it at ground zero, which would be near the depot bar. We chose this site because it would be maintained by the county. We got permission from them. So we didn't have to worry about maintenance. We didn't have to worry about lighting. Um, it's easy to find. And of course it's associated with the firefighters. As we mentioned earlier, 13 firefighters lost their lives in this great disaster. And it was secure. They're going to have people around here all the time. So that's why we chose this location. Um, what you see here are granite blocks that the county donated. They donated those, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> donated to us. Um, and each statue will be standing on one of these blocks here. So uh, those were chosen and transported there. Where is it? So this is fire station number one, uh, located on Idaho and Mercury. 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 Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, so of the statues that have been completed, as I mentioned earlier, uh, callback 72 has been completed. If you'd like to look in that, you're welcome to go into the lobby of the fire station. Uh, Jim the horse is out there. Uh, our board loves this photo because we imagine this is probably pretty similar to what Jim looked like on that night um, with the light okay. snow dusting, possible ash. Uh, you guys get a great picture there. This is cool. Chief Angus Cameron is being constructed. He starts from the feet up, of course, with the people, slowly works his way up, gives them some structures, some moans, and is working on the rest of it. So, what needs to be done, uh, Edwin Two Bear Robbins, E.G. Frazier, and Copeland's Dog. Uh, so if you want to support us, we'd always love that. We have buckets uh, to make donations if you're able to today. Uh, if you want to donate at a later time, please get a hold of us. We'd love to have that. Um, Out of the Ashes is the book that has been referenced many times. They're um, available to buy here at the archives if you're interested. Um, and we'd love to have you at our 125th uh, anniversary commemoration, which is occurring down at the original fire hall that these firefighters left from that fateful night 125 years ago. Um, six o'clock, we'd love to have you there. And then after that, we're actually going to have a short reception up here. So from one fire station to another. <laughs> so um, yeah, and if you guys have any questions, oh, I got one more thing. And I do too. <laughs> I, want, I want to acknowledge our, our board of directors that we have. Um, Jim McCarthy was supposed to be the one that gave our talk today, so I'm sorry if you guys came here to see Jim. <laughs> Failed on us. He ghosted us. He ghosted us. He was here. Yeah, well, he's here, but he's not here. He's here. Um, so Jim is our, our chairman. I'm the vice chairman. Judy and Karen are our co-secretaries because that is a major job. Um, which I used to be, and I said, I can't do this anymore, I'll just be a board member, and they said, well, how about you're the vice president, the vice chairman, I'm like, ah, oh, okay. Doesn't require as much work, so they teamed up. Um, Holly Carpenter is our treasurer, and then the rest are our voting board members and our non-voting board members. Um, so thanks to all of them. If they are here, if you guys are here and you're part of our board, will you please stand up to be recognized? David Bratton in the back there. So if you guys have any questions afterwards, um, please holler at any of us wearing 
wearing red shirts. I wore the wrong red one. <laughs> You've got the firemen on the back of yours. Yeah. So. <laughs> Oh, okay, hold on. Judy has one more thing. <laughs> so we've spent a lot of time trying to find family members of the victims who perished from the disaster, and we have two of them here. Sue Eulen, would you mind standing, Sue? <laughs> two, two bears brought them. And then we have a new lady that we just found by the grace of God, Barbara Stroll. Yes. And her, her family member was uh, Fred Bolton, one of the firemen. Yes. Thank you for joining us. It means a lot. Your wife yeah. is? Peters. Oh, okay. is she here? Yes. Oh, yay! Yay! That's fabulous. You have a question? <laughs> Uh, there was a documentary on this here a year, two years back. Yeah, sure. So the documentary that was created was created by Gus Chambers, and it's called The Hidden Fire. Is that the one you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great documentary. Yeah. It's still available. Yep, it's still available, and you can find it online, pbs.org, and PBS shows it pretty frequently, at least probably once a year. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, before we get to the questions, this is Meg Peters. Um, in doing the research, all of the stories that we found, we had 57 victims. So this is where divine intervention came in. I was strolling the internet one night, late at night, and I ran across a newspaper article out of Missoula that said the 58th victim of the fire had died. So I texted Jim and Judy and I said, at midnight, we got a problem. We have 58 victims instead of 57 that's been recorded. So we started doing the research, and his name was Brink. And I think some of you may remember the old Brink store. What happened with his death was he was in his house. He was hit in the head with a rabble head that came through the window. Hit his skull. He went to the doctor. They stitched it up, thought he was fine. He went home. The coroner's docket closed on January 31st. In March, he started having severe headaches and he went back to the doctor. They realized that he had um, bone fragments pressing on his brain, so they did a surgery. Came through the surgery, but he contracted something called erysipelas, which is a strep infection. And he died from that. But his actual death certificate does list him as explosion and erysipelas. So in reality, he is the 58th victim of this explosion. And that was a piece that was lost until we started doing this intense research and he is related to Peters's. Well, no. he actually worked for Kenyon Noble. Oh, did he? He used to do the wood in the basement and he identified the wood and uh, whatever they do. Yeah, yeah. He, graded. he graded it. This has been what has spurred Judy and I on in our whole group to do this book about the 58 victims is they're not just names, they're people. They're, they're people that are related to all these people that we have here. And there's so many more of them that we need to find their, their families. And we're so happy that we were able to recognize Brink and from this day forward in our everything that we do, he will be included. So. Any other quick questions? No? All right, well, we're going to stick around afterwards if you guys want to chit-chat with us at all. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for coming.